Good morning. So maybe some of you aren't familiar with the Christian Standard Version. We're going to be using the, that version and the New Living Translation kind of interchangeably uh, throughout this process. Um, I guess I want to start off at Ed Baldwin and myself. We've been working on this sermon series for a while. And boy, you'd think that preaching on one chapter of the book of the Bible would be easy. But how easy is it, Ed? Not at all, eh? Not at all. So we just thought that what we would do is maybe just give you the, the full um, chapter each week if we can so that you can have a chance to read yourself. There are study notes that are included in the back and online for your home groups. So they are there. Um, you know, before... Uh, before... Before we start today, um, I just kind of wanted to pray this, um, this prayer uh, from Paul when he spoke to the church in Corinth. And maybe you, most of you are familiar with this. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. When I came to you, brothers, announcing you the testimony of God, I did not come to you with brilliant speech or wisdom, for I didn't think it was a good idea to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a powerful demonstration by the Spirit, so your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. So today we're going to pray that. Father God, all the stuff that's happening here today, the worship, uh, the message, uh, the communion, everything that we do today, we just pray in the name of Jesus that uh, what we do here would not be by wise and persuasive words, but we are asking for a demonstration of your Spirit's power so our faith would not rest on just mere human wisdom, but on your power. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a kind of, there's a message that I'm compelled to share, uh, but I can't share it to the end. So, uh, a lot of what I'm going to say is kind of leading up to that point. Uh, if you really want to know uh, more about, the, uh, about what we're going through, come to the, uh, Ed's Bible class, because he does a great job in Bible teaching, or come to home group, where we're going to be teaching as well. But there's going to be kind of a message at the end. Uh, but first, I just want to start off with the preamble, if that means anything to you. So I got to say this to say that, and I'll tell you when I'm going to say that. But first, I'm going to say this. Clear as mud? Not so clear. Okay, well, just stay with me here. Um, you know, there's a story uh, that I read not too long ago uh, about this uh, gal, this lady. She came to church, and she was pretty impressed with church. And, you know, the people were nice, and they were friendly, and they served uh, pie. I'm not sure pie was in the story, but we'll just say that. Uh, she served pie, or, or they served pie, and it was just a nice place to be. You know, she, she felt really welcomed. And I, and I think that, that this church is kind of that place. You can come here and feel pretty welcome. But she came up to the pastor and said, you know, pastor, you know, I really like this church thing. And, you know, I don't come from a church background or anything. Uh, you know, like, is there a book I could read, you know, that may be like Church for the Idiots or something, you know, you know, kind of learn what it is you're doing? And the pastor thought, and he goes, well, you know, maybe... Maybe you need this book, the good book, the Bible. And there's lots of books written about God, um, lots of authors. But we have uh, decided to do our best to go through uh, 40 chapters of the Bible and try as much as we can to stay within the conscripts of those chapters and to stay within the realm of the Bible and try not to deviate too far from it. So uh, I'm going to do my best. Ed's going to do his best. And Ed and I are going to hold each other accountable. So that's what you're going to get. So it's the good book. It's the Bible. And in this church, I know that some of your Bibles will look like that one. Some of your Bibles will look like, like that, right? What is that? So uh, you, you feel free to take out your, your Bible 
don't, and try not to text your friends, but you, I guess I'm not going to know any different if you do. But we declare <clears throat> in this church, you know, Steve said, uh, Pastor Steve said that uh, we're all about Jesus. And, you know, he, he talks about Jesus all the time, that guy. Pretty hard to get him not to talk about Jesus. And, but he also believes something else. I know this to be true, that he believes that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. And so, you know, we spend, your pastors and people that work here and other people that come by, we spend a lot of time, you know, really kind of digging into the word to see what it really means. And it is a challenge. Um, so we believe, we declare that the word that we study, the word that Lorelai read here, she read you the first chapter of the book of Genesis, the very first chapter in the book of the Bible. And we believe that to be the inerrant word of God. And we spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. And having said that, um, the Bible is an old book. It's a powerful book. And the more you read it, the more powerful it seems, and really the less old it seems. It seems very relevant, you know, when you dig in deep. And I was thinking in, in to pr perspective on it that we're not that old, and we're not that mature, and we're certainly not that wise. You know, like Canada, does anybody know how old Canada is? 100, 150 years old. So 150 years ago, what was here? Not, I don't know, a field? A, a buffalo or something? I don't know. A beefalo. Okay, I don't know. I mean, there was, I mean, I can't hardly imagine. I mean, 150 years ago, uh, there was no cars here, no parking lot here, no road here. I, I don't think that Manitoba was actually even a province 150 years ago. So that's like three lifetimes, not even that. You know, like two and a half lifetimes. So I just want to put perspective on the, on the, on the power and the presence of the book of Genesis and how, how it existed before time itself existed. You know, that, that the first cell phone was invented in 1973. Now, could you imagine not having a cell phone right now? An ice cream cone, uh, it appeared in the 1904 World's Fair. So that's, that's even, there's, that's even, that's even one lifetime ago. So I want us to just kind of have an idea of the depth of knowledge and wisdom that the Bible has. It speaks to our earth. Some things we really have a hard time answering, like, you know, when was the earth created? You know, in the 17th century, John Lightwood, a famous theologian, said that the world was exactly 3,929 years old. I don't know how he figured that out. When you read uh, the Christian Research Institute, uh, they tell us, you know, uh, they try to discern how old the world, how old the world is, and they somewhere between 6,000 years and 15,000 years. Well, well, I don't know. The general scientific population tells us that the world is, uh, is you know, 4.54 billion years old, give or take 50 million years. So maybe we just kind of leave that alone. We can look at how the world was made. Now, maybe that's a little harder. I don't know. But, uh, you know, there's a story of these, you know, uh, trying to create... Uh, life out of things that exist. And I know that scientists are, are trying to create life. They've made lots of efforts to create life. And, and one of the things I read was that uh, life was created at something called absolute zero. And so I'm not sure what that is, but I think it's pretty cold. Not maybe Winnipeg weather. Um, but there's a story of these scientists who come to God and they say, God, we have taken 
all the elements of the world, all the various elements and, and, and dust particles and everything else, and managed to put them together in this test tube. And then we jolted them with some electricity. And wouldn't you know it, we got an amoeba. So we have created life out of all this stuff, God. And you know what God said? Get your own stuff. <laughs> so we're not really good at saying when and probably how. I mean, maybe we could get to that at some point. But maybe we just need to be talking about who. So Lorelai, Lorelai did a great job reading. Um, I always like listening to her read. It reminds me of when she was reading Bible stories to my little kids. So I'd sit out the door and get to listen. She's a way better reader than I am. Um, in the scripture that we're looking at, Genesis chapter 1, and feel free to turn to it if you want to. Uh, some of it will be up on the board there. In the beginning, God. That's where we're going to park for a moment. In the beginning, God. So what we're really saying is that before anything that was, is, God was. Before time, before dust particles, before anything, before anything, there was God. And you know, I took this opportunity to deviate a little tiny bit from the text because I wanted to say that, uh, you know, now the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the surface of the watery depths and the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. So uh, let's just take, that's the text, right? So we have this sort of formless mass of something, you know, and the spirit of God is hovering over this land or whatever it was at the time, some formless thing. And we know that the Father God was there, you know, because he's the creator. But I wanted to throw in my little job for the Trinity because I love this, right? In the beginning, this is out of John chapter 1. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was God. The word was, and the word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created through him that was created. Do you know who that person is, the word? It is Jesus Christ. So there's my job for the Trinity. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all involved in this creation. This is the who. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, hovering over this, this faceless kind of thing. In the beginning, God. Wow. Can, can, you, can your mind go back? Can your mind go to that place? Before time, before ice cream cones, you know, before cars, before grass, certainly more than 150 years ago. Like, we think we're all that at 150 years. Like, 150 years. There are, that's like nothing. Zero. And is, is it like 3,968 years, or is it a give or take plus or minus 5.45 billion or something? I mean, before all of that time, before the scientists figured out that they could create some kind of form of life, which they can't. I mean, that was just a story. Before all of that, before your last paycheck or your headache or what you had for breakfast, before time itself began, there was God. In the beginning... God was here. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths and the spirit of the God was hovering over the waters. The spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now I'm going to divert a little bit more and Ed's going to say, Kelly, you diverted twice already. But I want to say to you that that same spirit that hovered over the waters, that same Jesus Christ that was there building the earth, with his dad, with his father. That same spirit is the same spirit that it says in Romans 8, 11, 
If the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Do you know what it's saying? It's the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. It's the same spirit that was there when the earth was being built. It's the same spirit that lives and breathes in you. This is pretty crazy stuff, right? Like, did, who is at Ed's Bible study today? You really need to go to this because he brings up the deep stuff. So come a little earlier, have a cup of coffee and sit and listen to what he has to say because he's telling you how valuable you are in God. And we're going to get to that later. But the same spirit, can you imagine, before the earth was built, before anything that was became, the spirit, God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, hovering over that, over that uh, sort of mound of something, Right? very same spirit that's in us. That's, that would be a sermon right there, don't you think? Like, wouldn't you just like to think about that and ponder that? It's not just about being a nice person or anything. This is God, the God that created the world, living and breathing in us. Day one, God said, light, he spoke. This is, okay, so we're not talking about stuff. God just spoke. Okay, God Father, Son, Holy Spirit, light. Light. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good and separated the light from darkness. He just called it one day and one night. He just decided in his infinite wisdom before anything that was created, anything that was built, anything that was, let just let there be light, and there was light. He just spoke it into existence. Then he said, let there be atmosphere, you know? And he said, you know, let the, the expanse to separate the waters, you know, from the land. And, and he, just, he just simply, I guess simply is not the word, is it? Miraculously. Then God said, Water. Let the water under the sky be gathered into one place. And let the dry land appear. And it was so, so God called the dry land earth. And he called the gathering of the water seas. He, you know, I spent a lot of time on the water. And I still have this, you know, anybody who's done that, you know, you, you have a great uh, love and fear for the water. But to imagine the power of, of, of the oceans the power of the weather as it, the, these hurricanes come smashing down on land. God just, he just spoke and then these things existed and he produced the vegetation and seed-bearing plants. And, and Ed said, in the Amazon, there's how many trees? Thousands. They don't even know. You know, I remember reading that, that they were afraid of, of tearing some of these forests down because what they have found are cures for so many diseases and things in these trees. And the trees of the, uh, the trees of the nation, the trees are given, leaves of the trees are given for the healing of the nations. There's miracles and things that God has already created that we're sort of just tearing down and, and burning. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. Now, this is interesting because you're going to have different versions of your Bible. American Standard Version and the New Living Version are different in this. This, this version that we're reading, the Christian Standard Version captures this. They will serve as signs for festivals for the days and years. So what God is saying is that I'm, I'm putting these, these lights into the sky and they'll serve as signs. So he's not just saying, like the New Living, New Living Translation tells us that it gives us seasons. This is true. It's only partially true. And it's written from a perspective. But from this version, from American Standard, and I think the King James Version says the same thing, that these lights uh, that God created are not just there to tell us for the separation of the, of the seasons. Can you, do you know a light? Can you think of a light that God used to extend his kingdom? Is there a particular light that God, he's hinting at something, isn't he? 
Father, Son, Holy, he's hinting at something. If he says, look, I'm these lights are going to be signs for festivals. Wasn't there a north star that guided the wise men to Christ? It says in uh, Matthew 2, 9 to 10, it says, when they had heard uh, the king, they set out and there ahead of them what, went the star that led and uh, went the star that they had been that they'd seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. So there was this this something that happened in the heavens that these wise men were aware that something significant was happening. God knew that he would use that particular event to lead people, to lead wise men to Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of all people. Now, this is all sort of figured out before anything that was built was really built. Is this, is this making sense to you? Isn't this kind of really wild stuff? That before the beginning of time, God is already building into this, this, this method for our salvation, for to save us. He's already doing this so the wise men will find Jesus, this babe wrapped in a manger, that it's already built into the system. And I, I am amazed that, that we don't just say that he's given us the, the lights to, for seasons. No, no, not just seasons. He's given it to us so that there'll be a sign so that we will find God. Day five. Then God said, let the water swarm with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created large sea creatures and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water according to their kinds. He also created every winged bird across its kind and God saw that it was good so God blessed them. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. Everything came in that morning on the fifth day. Can you imagine? You want to say a day to create creatures that inhabit the earth with all of their things and all of their... Do we believe this? Does this sound like a fairy tale to you? You know, often, often when I, when I listen to, uh, you know, to a podcast, and uh, they start to talk about um, creation, they talk about creation myths. I said earlier that we believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Now, I'm going to suggest that if the scientists are having a hard time figuring out whether the world is 15,000 years or 45 billion years, plus or minus, whatever the numbers were, that we've only been here in this particular country for 150 years, and we're, we think we have it all figured out, we are not the smartest kids on the block or the sharpest pencils in the box. That what God is telling us, he's, in, he's, he's, he's telling us how he created the world and everything in it. Out of just speaking it into existence. There's no, there was nothing there before. He didn't have to get his own stuff because he was the stuff. He spoke these things into existence. Father God, in my mind, it's hard for me to imagine that you could just speak something into existence and have it be, but it's true. It really happened, and it's still happening. God is still building. He's still creating. And now the sermon. I had to say all that, to say this. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Another point for the Trinity. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. 
Brother Lou, that would be you. Brother Lou, my friend who is from uh, Newfoundland, um, good believer, everybody was Brother Lou, so you can be Brother Lou. Brother Lou, on your worst day, you are more like God than anything else in all creation. On your worst day. So if you're full of fear, anxiety, hatred, anger, or if you just don't know that you belong, you are created in the image of the Creator. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let us create man in our image. Not the dogs or the cats or the fish but you personally. Do we physically look like God? Is that what it's saying? I don't know. Have you seen God? We know we, we know kind of what Jesus looks like because he came in an image of a man, but he came as our image, you know? I don't think we know what God looks like. Do you know what God looks like? Would you recognize him? Probably you would. So maybe it's not talking about a physical image. Maybe there's something more. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead resides in us so that the spiritual man may know all things. So those of us who have received Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have a sense of who God is that the rest of the world doesn't have, but it doesn't mean that the rest of the world doesn't thirst and hunger after God, because the rest of the world, every human being, even though they may not have a saving relationship with God, are still created in God's image. They're still part of that person that is created in in his image. And we're going to talk about the fall next week. But I want to say that uh, uh, is it a man that is created in God's image? And then the woman just kind of trails on afterwards? Or is it, does it say that he created them male and female in our image? Like, which is the more accurate statement? Is, is, a, is a man like a woman or a woman? Or a man like a, like, is a man like God or is a woman more like God? Which is it? Can we answer that question? So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. I'm going to suggest to you this, that a man, a man on his own, is created in the image of God, I'm going to say to you that a woman created on her own is the image of God. But I'm also going to suggest to you that when you put a man and a woman together, they become a more perfect image of God. Now, why can I say that? Is it because men and women are different? Yeah, I suppose they are. You know, I, I guess we could argue that point, but I think, I think probably they are. But what is it that a man and a woman joined together in a godly relationship do? They become one, yes. And from that one, something else occurs. Love. They create. They create. I mean, think about this. We have God the Creator, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit saying that let us create man and woman in our image. Man and woman. So together, when when a, a husband and a wife come together in a godly union, they create more image bearers just like God created image bearers. Can you see that there's a similarity in, the, in what God did and what we're doing in God's name? Am I the only one that sees this? A husband and wife come together. They, they love each other. They, they come together. 
And from that union comes a baby. And that baby carries with it the image of God like every other child born. And the scripture tells us that God knew our names before the foundations of the world were set. He knew you by name. He knew you by name before, the, before any of this world stuff even came around. He knew you by name. So just as God is God creates, we create. We use God's stuff. We make ice cream cones. You know, we do. I love ice cream. Never trust anyone who doesn't like ice cream. Be highly suspicious of those who only like vanilla. <laughs> we make cars. We build houses. We do all, these, all this creative stuff. But the most God-like thing that we do requires God's intervention for us to do to create a life. This, this makes us very special in God's eyes. Every time one of us has a baby, we create a living, breathing image of God. Wow. Okay, this, this should blow your mind because it blows my mind. You know what? My daughter, Kyla, is having a baby. I can tell it. I got her permission. (laughs) You know, and I I said, I I remember sitting with Kyla, and I said, Kyla, do you know that God knows your baby's name? You don't even know what sex your baby is. And God already knows everything. He knows that there's good works prepared in advance for that child to do. That that child, that's that little tiny person that's living inside of you has a name and was known by God before the world itself was even created. This is the story of Genesis. That you matter that much. You're more like God on your worst day than any other thing in all creation. That's, that's, that's what Genesis is so cool. Because it's telling you that you matter. And you're known. And God cares about you. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree, tree whose fruits contain seeds. This food will be given to you for all the wildlife of the earth and for every bird in the sky and every creature that crawls on the earth, everything having breath and life in it, I have given every green plant for food and so it was so. God saw what he had made and it was very good. Evening came, then the morning of the sixth day. I've given you everything to take care of, to look over, to manage in my name. And I knew you by name before this whole enterprise started. I knew your name before there was time. I knew your name before there was mud, an earth, or a star, or a light, or anything. Before, he says, the foundations of the world were set. I knew you by name. You are so special. On your worst day, on your worst day, you are more like God than anything else in all creation. Father God, I just admit that we had just scratched the surface of the, of the first chapter of Genesis. There is so much more to know. But we're humbled that we've only been in, in this province, this country, for 150 years. So we don't know that much. And we don't know how old the world is. or even how it was built. But we know we're special because you created us and you knew our names before the foundation of the world was set. And 
that same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the same one that hovered over the face of the earth when it was formless. lives and breathes in us if we've received you as our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to have our communion now, and we're going to ask those who are going to help serve it to come forward.